Five tips for a long and prosperous career in software from a self-taught coder. That would be me. I'm Jack Harrington, at her on Twitter, and I also YouTube as the Blue Collar Coder. And this is a collaboration with Shad's channel, and I'm really excited to bring you this information as I'm, again, a self-taught coder, and apparently this is going out to college folks and folks in boot camps, so I think that's, that's really great. There are some things that uh, I could learn from you, of course. I kind of regret not having gone to college, but it's been a great time. I've been in this business for a long time, and so here are some tips that I can give you. And before I begin, I just want to make sure that you understand that even though you are in not in a work context yet, uh, these can be very valuable for you uh, even right now. So just keep that in mind as we go through these. So tip number one, be adaptable. And I know that's kind of cliche, but that's really how you make a long career in tech. Things change so much and you really have to adapt to keep up as you go. And we see this all the time. You see on tech Twitter, you know, 100 days of code and you get these kind of generalist things where people say, you know, just keep coding, just keep coding. What does that, what does that mean? So I'll give you some advice on how to stay adaptable. And there's two things that you've got to do. So the first thing is to create an information pipeline for yourself. Subscribe to a lot of RSS feeds, get on a lot of newsletters, give yourself a habit of going to uh, content sites that have tech content every day, and just keep up with it. And then come up with a way of storing that information, some sort of notebook or something like that online or that you can share with your friends that allows you to organize all the links and tips and tricks and articles and videos that you find out there that help you in that particular topic. So let's just say it's uh, React or it's Angular, right? Come up with subsections where you can just kind of drop stuff in there. And then you will, over time, not only get a sense of you know the kind of breadth and scope of everything going on in that area, but also become a resource for other people. And the second thing is to either work on your own projects or do open source work. And what that allows you to do is get a lot of experience that you can put on a resume today. And as a hiring manager in the past, and now somebody who does a lot of hiring, as well as coding and everything else, I can tell you that I look on a resume for practical experience that I can leverage. So it's really important to kind of get that going. And in particular, when you're looking for open source work or projects that you want to create, Find areas that you would consider your weaknesses. Think about, oh, you know, this this area frightens me. You know, I'm not into you know functional programming, or I, I get frightened by you know this type of data structure. Well, work on that. Work on your weaknesses. It's just like any kind of other muscle building or whatever you want. You want to work on your weaknesses to make those better. And I think an extra benefit of all this is that. People early on in their careers and late in their careers, honestly, suffer from imposter syndrome. And a good remedy for imposter syndrome is just to feel more comfortable by knowing more, right? Part of imposter syndrome is that you don't feel like you know everything. Well, go out there. Make it a daily habit to consume new information, try stuff out, get out there and open source, make those connections, and then you'll feel like more of a citizen within the tech world. Another important element to being adaptable is that you want to learn patterns over learning specific technologies, right? Specific technologies come and go all the time, but patterns, how you structure your code, algorithms, data structures, these things don't tend to change over time. And another thing I find that people do is they get kind of, they, they find something that works for them and then they become that as they make that central to their life. Like for example, you Java for life or something like that. And nah, I would not recommend that. Technology changes too much and too frequently to kind of lock yourself into anything. And it also can give you some harsh opinions about stuff. And you'll see this a lot when people have hot takes on technology that doesn't fit with their understanding of what's what's good and what's bad. And I'm particularly unhappy about hot takes. And there are some reasons for that. One, I'm an open source contributor. I put a lot out into open source. I understand what it takes to make these technologies. We are blessed 
to live in a world where we sit on top of a mountain of awesome open source that makes it easy for us to do our jobs. And so every single piece of technology that is worth having a hot take on and popular enough is popular for a reason. It works for a lot of people. And coming out there and saying, this is bad and this is good is pretty ignorant, actually. And it's disrespectful to the people who have gone and done all that work to create software and give it to you for free. So as an alternative, if you want to sound more informed when it comes to opinions on particular technologies, give a pro and con. Say jQuery has these pros and these cons and React has these pros and these cons. And, and therefore, in this circumstance, I would select this one over that one. Both of those are phenomenal technologies that have been around for a long time and are worthy of our respect. And having looked into that technology enough to do a pros and cons analysis, you're going to find that you're actually learning more about that specific technology and understanding why it is popular among the people that it's popular with. Tip number two, find a niche. So I know I mentioned don't rabbit hole into any one particular technology or anything like that, but there are areas of expertise that you can use to build on your skill set and make you more valuable to companies. For example, accessibility is very good, data visualization, machine learning. These are all subspecialties that make you a particularly excellent candidate for a company. If you've got a, a full stack background, you can do stuff on the front end, you can do stuff on the, the server side, and you have some subspecialization in, say, React Native for mobile or things like that, you become a much more valuable asset for a company. All right, tip number three, empathy. You need to care about your coworkers if you want to have a long career in software. And part of that is understanding what people want to hear from you, like being able to put yourself in their shoes and understanding uh, how they think about the world and understanding how to craft your message to work for them and to communicate effectively and to understand how people think about what they hear from you, right? How they're internalizing those words. In particular, being passionate about stuff, having hot takes, as I mentioned earlier, that's not always the most effective way to communicate. You can communicate more clearly and succinctly by kind of communicating in terms of, say, business output, if you're talking to someone in the business space. Another important element is to be a listener, to actively listen to folks, to give people the space in meetings to be able to present their information to you, and also to ask for help. People love giving help, and that's a way that you can actually bank goodwill with folks, a way that you can actually bank you don't know everything, that you could use some help, and allowing them to help you is a great feeling, and it gives them a great feeling, and of course, you get that help, which is also great. And on the subject of empathy, there are skills that you can use to build up those empathy muscles. In particular, there's one I like to call the, the name replacement game. And the idea is fairly simple. If you have an expression, something that you like to say, and you think that one element of that expression might be particularly controversial or biased in one way or another, think about changing it to the alternative. For example, there's a lot of talk around about saying, hi guys, in a meeting. And people are like, okay, well, that's, that's standard. I do that all the time. You know, what's so offensive about that? Well, think about it this way. If someone were to say to you, hi girls, in a meeting where you were present, how would that make you feel? That essentially maybe misgenders you and that might not feel so good. So having those empathy skills and understanding how your words impact others is important in creating a career that has longevity in the software space. Tip number four, think like a manager. So another part of empathy, as I said before, was learning how to think like someone else. Well, think like the person that employed you. Learn the business, learn the domain. What are you trying to do? What is the business trying to accomplish? And that's gonna make you much more valuable in conversations about how to drive the software choices that you use to build out your business. So a big decision in the management space is buy versus build. And if you understand the business 
and what's important to the business, then you can help make a more informed decision about where the company spends its software dollars in terms of should we take something off the shelf if it's not mission critical or if it's mission critical, then is that something we want to invest in and own completely so that it becomes essentially part of the heart of the business. Another important thing is company culture. And you might be asked at some point in your career to come in and be a, an agent of cultural change. You'll hear that a lot. And it's important that when that happens or when someone asks you to do that, that you kind of stand back and assess the culture that you're coming into because cultures in a company are there for a reason. If a company is making money and doing stuff and selling products or whatever they're trying to do, the culture is working for them. So you need to find out what elements of culture are worthy of change and would be acceptable by the culture that you're going into. What might look dysfunctional to you from the outside might be perfectly functional inside, even though it just seems a little bit odd. It might not be like the last company you worked at. It might not be what the, the college culture was. But as I say, everything exists in these systems for a reason, and it's important to understand that reason first before you try and change it. And then lastly, understand that everything that your team asks you to do or your manager asks you to do is an, in effect a test. If somebody's asking you to uh, do a kind of uh, a vague project, then that's a test to you. Can you handle a vague project? Can you go and take a vague project, break it down into phases, manageable chunks, understand what the value of those chunks individually is going to be to the company, communicate that back, uh, and ask for help when necessary? All of these tasks, from be it from you know a single issue to that needs a text change on a page, all the way to building out a new architecture or design, these are all tasks and tests and they are meant to evaluate you as you go through your career progression. They'll give you, for example, a small task in that would be a nascent team lead type task. And they're assessing your ability to become a team lead. And it's important to you for you to understand that you are being tested, understand what they want to see as the output of that test, and then match those results if that's a test that you want to pass. But understand that even as you go from college into a career, all of us every day are still being tested. Tip number five, be friendly and make friends. I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but there are social elements, even in the time of a pandemic, that are important to creating long-term relationships. And you'll know if you've succeeded in creating those relationships when the people that you've worked with in the past come back to you and want to work with you again in the future. That's when you know you've created a, a positive impression on them going forward and you're building out a network of people in your career that have positive impressions on you that recommend you to their friends and their employers. And you'll be building out that, that social graph as you go forward. And that's important, not just starting in college in or in boot camp, but going through your whole career. You just have to keep going to those friendships. And that doesn't necessarily mean going out to bars all the time. There are lots of things that you can do to go and uh, gaming culture, uh, doing you know, board games, D&D, sports, going to high T, whatever, to go and build out those teams, take those opportunities to become a more involved team player. When you think about it, being friendly is just good business. People would rather work with someone who's nice and who can deliver a feature in a day than someone who's a jerk and can deliver a feature in an hour because that nice person is going to be amenable to making changes, to doing things, to having a conversation about stuff in a friendly and congenial manner. All right, here's an extra tip for you before we go. Work is is work. And this is something that I didn't learn early on in my career that stress is a thing, particularly in software. I know it seems like something we're sitting down all the time. It seems like we're in this, you know, very easy space. We're not doing neurosurgery. There's not a patient on the table who might die. We're not flying a 747 with a, a ton of passengers on board. 
mission critical mistakes might not end in somebody dying, but there's still a lot of stress there. If you haven't experienced it yet, there's something called a P0 or an SL1 in the managed service space. It basically means the site's down and everybody's got to run and, and try and jump in and get it back to working again or find out why it's not working and fix it. That can be super stressful. So you need to think about your stress level and build your stress skills so that they match the career that you're going into. For example, being a data scientist. Right? That's the kind of thing where you're not on the front edge of production uh, management or DevOps. That means you know, very rarely are you going to get called in on a weekend to fix something. Whereas somebody who might be working on the, the front end, the service or the, the, the front end servers and, and the front end clients, that's something where, yeah, you might be called in on the weekend to make some, get something back to working that's broken. So understand and manage that stress level in your career. And then finally, just take time for yourself, right? When you have those stressful situations, understand that that's okay. Everybody goes through those stressful situations. It is tough to manage. Talk to your manager, get some time, and be able to kind of work through that stress and externalize that stress so that you know, you're not having to deal with it you know, long term, and you're still with it, you know, long term in your position. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to put those in the comment section down below. If you like, feel free to come over to my channel and check out my content. It's not usually as generic as this. I go into detail on technology stuff, particularly on the front end. That's Blue Collar Coder, and there is a link in the description for this. In the meantime, as I like to say on my channel, be happy, be healthy, and be safe.